It's good to see you here this morning. I'm glad that you have come back after last week's message of the church of Ephesus. I'm glad that you still came back. Because I know some of what we said last week was hard. But I've been told that you want a pastor who's going to share those hard things with you. And so, um, I commend you for coming back. So thank you for doing that. And I trust that as we were singing those songs, that those are songs that, that you just don't say the words to, but that you really stop and think about the theology of those songs. Of Jesus being our firm foundation. About building our lives on the solid rock. And that Jesus being our all in all. Because there's so much that goes on in our world right now that can just detract us from what truly matters. And so, bringing us to the very presence of God here this morning. I trust that we will see Him in the text here this morning. You know, there's a famous statement throughout the history of the church, and it's this. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Sadly, that has become very, very true. As you look over the history of the church, the history of Christianity, suffering, persecution, martyrdom have all been part of the calling of the church. Somewhere along the line in the history of the church, there was suffering, there was persecution. Time magazine reported that the number of Christian martyrs doubled between 2012 and 2013. Nigeria led the way in 2012. Syria in 2013, with Iraq, Rwanda, and Sudan not far behind them. Some estimate that 65% of all those martyred took place since the dawn of the 20th century. And it's an estimated 100 to 150 million Christians have been martyred every year. Let's be honest. Here in America... We really don't know what it means to be persecuted. We really don't know what it means to suffer. We hear about all these things happening in other countries. And even in China, there are people meeting in underground homes out of fear of the government coming and throwing them in prison. And in fact, in some of those churches, there are people planted there by the government just for their time to bring them out. Here in our country, we really have no idea what it means to suffer. We have no idea what it means to be persecuted. And that brings us to our text here of Revelation chapter 2. We're in week 2 of our study of the seven letters to the churches of Revelation. These are representative of every church, everywhere, in all time. And so the letters that were written to these churches are letters written to us as well. Jesus gave them a very specific message. You'll notice that there's a pattern in all of these letters. When you get to the end, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear. So not only is it a letter for the churches as a whole, but it is also a letter to all of us as individuals. That Every one of us needs to hear what is being said to these churches. Last week, we covered the church of Ephesus and we identified it as the careless church. They were busy doing all the right things. They did everything right, but their motivation was wrong. They stopped loving Jesus the way they did at first. To go back to that enthusiastic life that you had when you first trusted Christ, when nothing else mattered. So much happens between the time we trust Christ to the time when He calls us home that that we let get in the way. And Jesus calls us back. Calls us back to that. And what that means is that it's it's possible for us as a church to be involved in all the right things, doing what churches are supposed to do, and lose sight of why we do it. So we have to take an honest look within ourselves. We have to look to determine what is our motivation. Is it out of love for Christ or is it out of obligation? So this morning, as we move into this next church, the church of Smyrna, we can label this church the suffering church. And I'll come back to this in just a moment, but I want to give you the main point that we're looking at here this morning. 
Our main point from understanding this church of Smyrna is that we need to be faithful in our suffering. Whatever that suffering may look like, whatever persecution you may face, and it comes in various ways, and it can come at various times, whatever that's looking like in your life, and I don't know what all is going on in your life right now, but there may be some here this morning that are suffering through some difficult circumstances. Wherever you are in this spectrum of suffering and persecution, be faithful. Be faithful. And we need to understand what it takes for us to be faithful. Kind of what we're going to kind of do here this morning is we're going to look at this text and we're going to just lay a, a, a foundation for a doctrine of suffering. So I think it really comes down to how do you view suffering? What is your theology of it? Because as a pastor and as a counselor, um, I, I deal with a lot of suffering. People suffering at the hands of others. People suffering because of their own uh, missteps and sins and things like that. And so you know, having a theology of suffering and doing it well. But before we get into the specifics of this particular letter, uh, I, I trust that you will indulge me a little bit of history. I know some of you aren't history buffs, all right? Uh, but I think if we understand a little bit of history, this will give us some greater insight into this specific letter. Okay? Because remember, these churches were composed of real people in real time under real circumstances. And I think if we have some insight into what some of those circumstances were, that will give us a greater insight into our life here this morning. So we need to know a couple things. We need to know about life for the first century believer. Right? Life for the first century believer. The first century believer lived under the control of the Roman Empire and the imperial cult. George Lucas and Star Wars is not the origin of the imperial cult. I just thought I would give that to you, all right? just, so, just so that you know that. In the Roman world, religion permeated all aspects of culture. There was no separation of church and state. All the ancient world, their worldview had categories much like we have today with politics, with mathematics, ethics, economics, philosophy, you name it, they, were, they all existed. And a religion would, could often be based on some of those. In other words, you could have a religion that incorporated mathematics in its worship. And if you were a citizen in first century Rome, you, and if you had any kind of um, job, you were part of a club, so to speak, or a guild. And each guild was involved in worship. Worship was a part of everyday life. And you had to participate in some form of worship or else you weren't contributing to the benefit of Rome. And so if you were a Christian, let's say you were a Christian carpenter, Okay, and there was this carpenter guild. You had to be a part of that guild if you wanted your business to thrive. And part of being in that guild meant that you were going to worship the God that this guild was involved with. And if you didn't, your, your um, profession would be boycotted. You, you would not grow in your, in your job. You would lose your livelihood. That was life in the first century believer. So it was a cultural expectation that you were going to be involved in worship. And emperor worship became a real part of life in the first century. Uh, it began kind of after the assassination of Julius Caesar. And you would be given a certificate of worship. If you went and you worshipped the emperor, you would have to be given a certificate of worship because if they came around and you didn't show that certificate of worship, you could be thrown into the arena to deal with all the bees because that was part of life. They believed that if you didn't participate in that, you were against Rome and you were going to hurt the culture because they believed the gods impacted everything. And so we had to appease the gods. We had to worship them all the time. And so it was a very part of their livelihood, all right? And that went against the, the theology of the, of the Jews and of the Christians. They had multiple gods. And so uh, 
the Jews and the Christians would not participate in that. But, but here's the critical point with, with this. For a while, Christianity was tolerated. As long as the Jews accepted Christianity. Rome accepted Jews because of the population of Jewish people that lived in that time and they didn't want to um, create a problem. right? So they accepted the, the Jewish people and they, they accepted their worship. And as long as they weren't trying to recruit more, they were okay. Right? They were okay. It was when Christianity started with the ministry of Paul that the Jews started having problems. And, and so the Jews would then start going against the Christians. And I'll talk more about that when we get to a particular point in the text. But, but that, was, that was part of life there as a first century believer. So if you were a believer in the first century, your very livelihood could be taken because of your refusal to worship the gods of their time. You could even lose your life as a result of it. Being thrown into the arena to deal with ravenous beasts. It was a real thing in real time. Right, you can go and you, you can Google them and you, you can see pictures of the arenas, the coliseums, and, and you can learn about what happened in those particular things. Now there's much more that could, that could be said about that, but I encourage you to, to go back and, and look at that on your own. Now we get to this letter of Smyrna. What was life like in Smyrna? Smyrna was um, called the crown of Asia, so to speak. It's still a large city today, although it's not called Smyrna. Today, you could go to Turkey and go to the city of Izmir, I-Z-M-I-R, and that's where Smyrna was. It's the third largest city in Turkey. It was the finest, one of the finest cities compared to Ephesus. It was like second, second in line to Ephesus. And the reason why was because this was a city that was built very well. It was structured. Their, their streets were at right angles. And so it kind of went up this hill. And so as you're, if you were a visitor walking through Smyrna, you could be going up this, this hill. And at the very top of the city was a temple to Zeus. Okay, So there were temples all over the place to all their gods. And there was a temple built for Caesar worship. In fact, Smyrna was one of the first cities to, to really have a full temple built to the worship of Caesar. And yes, involved in the worship of Caesars was sacrifices, offerings, and all kinds of things going on there. So that's what was happening in this particular city. Smyrna also became known for the execution of this man by the name of Polycarp. I'm like, who in the world is Polycarp? You can go and you can Google him. Google is your friend. can be your friend. You can Learn a little bit more about this polycarp. P-O-L-Y-C-A-R-P. That's not multi, multi-fish. All right, That's a guy. That, his name is Polycarp. Polycarp was the pastor of this church at Smyrna. Okay? He was a real pastor, real person. All right? He was also a disciple of John. Polycarp was executed in Smyrna. It started out... They, were, they wanted to burn him at the stake. Right? They wanted to burn him because he would not worship Caesar. He would not recant his faith. And the fire didn't consume him. So what did they do? They stabbed him to death. Real time. Real people. Real suffering. Polycarp was the pastor. He died in this city of Smyrna. The name Smyrna actually came from the name for myrrh. We're familiar with myrrh, right? The birth of Jesus, it was one of the gifts given to him. It's also associated with death. It's a burial spice. So Smyrna became famous for two things. It's beauty and it's suffering. It's only mentioned here in the Scriptures, but in other historical literature, you will find that Smyrna became a place of great suffering for believers. That is the context by which this letter is written to this church. This church exists in the first century with that kind of history. Where people are dying. Their very pastor is going to lose his life because of the faith. Now we don't know anything like that here. 
I'm not saying it's not going to happen because it very well may be. Right? If something came down where I lost my life or I was in prison because of preaching the truth, how would you respond? What would you do if your elders were taken away from you because of their stand on the truth? Would you be able to stand strong? To be faithful? Remember our main point. Be faithful in suffering. So we're going to spend the rest of our time now looking at, at and developing a deeper relationship with Christ by, by understanding some four critical truths. Four critical truths to help us handle suffering well. So I really think that if we can learn to handle suffering well, we can be faithful. We can be faithful. Well, let's look at what Jesus says here. The first thing is that Jesus is sovereign over all things. That's the first critical truth that we need to get. If you want to handle suffering well, we need to understand that Jesus is sovereign over all things. Look at verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life. Says this. Remember, Jesus in His description of Himself, He gave a description of Himself that would fit the context of this church. So He wants them to know something. This is the suffering church. He wants them to know something about Him that's going to help them. And it said Jesus is sovereign over all things. The first thing here is He's sovereign over time. Jesus describes Himself as the first and the last. The protos and the eschatos. Right? The first and the last. Jesus is declaring Himself as God here because we see in Isaiah 44, verse 6, we read this, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. Jesus just said He is the first and the last. And Isaiah says there is no God beside me. So what is Jesus saying? He is God. He is first. He is last. He is deity. The emphasis here is on His eternality and sovereignty. He's the eternal Lord over all time and history. He has the last word. He's always aware of the circumstances of His people. He's the God of all time. He knows their situation in real time. He knows their situation and what's going to happen. He has their future in plain sight. You probably already know where I'm going with this. He knows your situation. He is sovereign over that. He sees your time. He sees your future. He is sovereign over that. He is the first and the last. Time is in His hands. And just as Jesus is trustworthy in time past, He is going to be trustworthy in future time. And so we can take our todays and we can put them within His hand because He controls it all. We can trust Him. He knows it. He sees it. He's sovereign over time. The One who was before all things exists even when all things end. He's sovereign over time. He is also sovereign over death and life. It says here, not only is He the first and the last, but He describes Himself as who was dead and has come to life who was dead and who has come to life. The first and last draws attention to His deity. He who was dead and has come to life draws attention to His humanity. Jesus experienced death for us. He experienced all that we could ever face this side of heaven. While on the cross, He bore the full weight of our sin upon Himself. He met the wrath of God. He paid our penalty. They paid the penalty for the whole world. He was subjected to slander, persecution, rejection, imprisonment. He's not someone who has no idea what we're going through. He's a high priest who knows exactly what you're going through. Wherever you are in in, in this spectrum of suffering and persecution, Jesus has been there. 
And he's come out on the other side. He's victorious. And because he is victorious, you are victorious. Philippians 1.21 says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. How can we say that? Because we serve a risen Savior. Being in Christ is a win-win. He lives and we live with Him. And so this description that Jesus gives is a reminder that whatever happens between the time of conception until the time where you take your final breath, Jesus controls it all. He was there at the very beginning. He's going to be there at the very end. You can trust Him. He's sovereign over all things. Critical truth number one is is to recognize in our suffering that Jesus is still in control of that which causes you harm. And that should bring great comfort to us. Because we know the character of Christ, do we not? We know who Jesus is. And we know that, that Jesus is not going to allow anything into our life that's going to destroy us. We know that those things that come into our life are there for a reason. And that ultimate reason is to conform us into His image. And so we can trust Him. He controls time. He controls life and death. We are all in His hands. Critical truth number one. Critical truth number two is found in verse 9, and it's this. Jesus knows when His people suffer. Jesus knows when His people suffer. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Jesus knows. Jesus knows when we face trials and tribulations. The word used here for tribulation is a word that is not just the general struggle. But this is a word that that talks about distress. Are you here this morning and you're stressed? You've got some things happening in you that that you're just, you're being crushed under the weight of those? Jesus says He knows it. He knows what is hurting you. He knows when you go through those difficult things, those painful and wearisome things. And notice Jesus, Jesus doesn't minimize it. He doesn't say, well, it'll be okay, just, just get up and rub some dirt on it and you'll be fine. He doesn't say that. He doesn't minimize it at all. He doesn't cheapen it by offering some unsympathetic advice. What He does is He says, I know. And that should bring comfort to all of us to, to recognize that Jesus knows everything we experience. It's one of the most discouraging things about our suffering is sometimes feeling like we're alone. We feel like no one else cares. No one else is seeing us. I'm alone in my struggle. I'm at the deepest part of the valley. And Jesus says He knows. Reminding them and reminding us that we are not alone in our struggle. We are not alone in our struggle. Jesus is right there in the midst. Remember what we said last week? What is Jesus doing with these churches? He's walking around. He's in the very midst of the church. And He sees. And Jesus is in the very midst of your life. Not just on Sunday morning. But on Monday morning. On Tuesday. On Wednesday. On Thursday. He sees all. He knows you're not alone. And that should bring us comfort. He says that to you. He's with you in the difficulty. He's not surprised by your struggle. He knows it. You're not out of His watchful care. He knows what to do. He knows the burdens that are weighing heavily upon you. He knows what to do. Trust Him. He knows our poverty. And notice I put poverty in quotes. Now, uh, I think we need to separate a little bit here of understanding what he's talking about with their poverty. 
We, I, I don't think we really fully grasp the poverty that these people were experiencing. Now, you may not be a, a wealthy person um, by the world's standards, but these people, this is not just a normal word for poverty, saying poor. These people, they didn't have the basic necessities. That's what this word means. They were lacking the basic necessities of life. They weren't just poor. They were at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. They were poor. The reason why I put that in quotes for us is that we think we're poor, but in reality, we as a country, when you compare our wealth to the wealth of those around, we're extremely rich. But notice what Jesus says. He knows your poverty, but in reality, you are rich. See, when we lose sight of our wealth in Christ and we allow the allurements of the world to define who we are, we bought into all of that which means nothing. Jesus says, you are rich. When God defines us, that is the rock bottom truth that no matter how the world wants to spin it, no matter how the world wants to redefine us, we are rich. Because we have all the wealth we need in Christ. We are rich beyond measure. Remember what I told you at the beginning. These people had lost their very livelihoods because of their faith. And so because of that, they were viewed as the bottom of the spectrum. They were the lowest of the low in in culture. Even though we may not be that by the world standards, we have a treasure trove of wealth in Christ. By telling the church in Smyrna that they're rich, he's redirecting their focus. Think about it from our perspective. What happens when we're focused on gaining material possessions? when we strive after that which we think we need, which we think will define us by the world standards, we lose sight of our richness in Christ. And so Jesus is really trying to redirect their thoughts to focus on Him and realizing that they're truly rich. And although the world may say you're poor, God looks at you and says, you're extremely rich. So don't let, let, don't let the world define you. Don't, don't let the world kind of suck you in. The only thing that matters in the end is whether you belong to Jesus. That's it. That's all that matters. Do you belong to Him? Regardless of the earthly treasures taken by their persecutors, there was no one who could steal their faith. No one could take that away from them. And the promise here is that they're going to be viewed in God's eyes with richness Our wealth is secured in Christ. And so we we can trust that. So Jesus knows our struggle. He knows when when we're fighting trials. He knows our physical conditions. He calls us rich. But then He also says He knows who really opposes us. He knows who really opposes us. He identifies two specific foes here. Hostile Jews and Satan himself. Here's what's happening. These were descendants of Abraham by physical birth, but not spiritual birth. Meaning that they were Jews nationally. But from the Scriptures, we understand that a true Jew was going to worship God, right? Jesus, He's going to describe them here in just a moment. They were descendants of Abraham by physical birth, but not spiritual birth. Remember, Jews were exempt from emperor worship. As long as Christianity was under their umbrella, they too were exempt from emperor worship. But once the Jews started despising Christianity and denouncing it, those who refused to participate in Roman idolatry would face retribution. We see that beginning in Acts 18. You see Jews up against Paul and creating a problem. And Paul was thrown into prison because of things the Jews had done. Okay? I mentioned the martyrdom of Polycarp. 
Historical records of that event tell us that it was Jews who went out and gathered the wood for His burning. And they gathered it on the Sabbath day. Now, if you know anything about Jewish custom, you know that the Sabbath day was a day that you didn't go do anything. So they willingly violated their own principles of obedience to the Sabbath to go and collect the wood to burn this person because of their belief in Christ. So at first glance, you would say, man, the Jews were really against the Christians. But what does Jesus say about them? The real enemy is, was not the Jews. The real enemy was Satan. He says here, he, this is a strong terminology here. He identifies them as a tool of the real enemy. The real enemy is Satan himself. The Jews were hostile. They were bent on persecuting the followers of Christ. Why? Because they were under the influence of Satan. He calls them a synagogue of Satan. Instead of them gathering to worship God, in reality what they were doing was they were worshiping Satan. Now, they, they didn't consider themselves that, but I'll explain this here in just a minute. They didn't have these, these things, these idols made up to Satan or anything, anything like that. But we need to understand this. The word Satan is a Hebrew word that means adversary. Right? He, he's the adversary. Scripture is very clear about the reality of, of Satan. He's not this guy with a, with a pitchfork and, and, and horns and a, and a pointed tail. All right? That's not the picture of Satan. In fact, the Scripture says, if you look in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, if you were to be able to see Satan, the Scripture calls him the sum of all beauty. So you would look at him and you would think he's the most beautiful creation that ever existed. And the Scripture says he, he walks around like a, a masquerading as an angel of light. You would never recognize him if you saw him. In the Scriptures, he's also called the father of lies. He, he's the adversary. Uh, he's against God in every single way. And what this tells us is that all who oppose the cause of Christ, this side of heaven, are really tools of Satan. What he's saying here. Because look at what Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 30. He who is not with me is what? Against me. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. My friends, we we are fighting a spiritual war. And what we see going on out there is not the flesh and blood enemies that we have. The real enemy is that, that who is behind. And that is Satan. We are in a spiritual war. And Jesus says He knows who the real enemy is. And Jesus wants them to know. He's fully aware of everything that Satan's doing. All that they're going to experience. All who stand in opposition. And He's sovereign over all of that. And it may look like He's lost control of things, but He hasn't. Jesus never loses control of any of it. We look at all of the evil out there that's going on right now, and we see that it just gets worse and worse and worse. And Jesus is saying, I'm still in control of that. So no matter what level of suffering you're going to find, Jesus is still in control. He knows it. He sees it. He's not surprised by it. So the question then that we have to ask is, whose side are you on? Are you on God's side or are you on Satan's side? There is no middle ground. You're either with Jesus or you're against Him. Are you going to be with Him or are you going to be against Him? That's the question. If you're not helping to gather in what He say you're doing, you're scattering. That's what they were doing. So that's critical truth number two. Critical truth number three is we can anticipate suffering. We can anticipate it. Verse 10. He says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. We see both a command and a promise here in, in this verse. And it's this, we are commanded to trust 
and promised to suffer. We're commanded to trust. And here's what I know about the commands of God. When God gives us a command, He always gives us the power and ability to obey it. So this is not something that we say, well, I just can't. My suffering is too hard. No, God says, trust. And so when we choose not to trust, we're being disobedient. We're walking in disobedience if we choose to not trust God. And then he says, you're going to suffer. Jesus told them that the devil would do everything in his power to break them, to stamp them out. But Jesus is going to use Satan's evil intentions to refine and to to prove them. He's going to reveal their faith. He's going to reveal their loyalty and their love. And, you know, as I was studying this text, and even in in my realm as as a counselor, I often have to deal with this question. Why do God's people have to endure suffering? You think, God, I've given my life to you. Shouldn't life be easier for me? Man, why, why did I give my life to you, God? If this is what the Christian life is about, man, God, what, what's going on? Why am I suffering? So that's a question I have to deal with a lot. So I want to kind of just kind of give us, I'm really just going to kind of scratch the surface here with what we're going to say next. Try to help us get a good theology of suffering. Why do God's people suffer? I'll put them up here so you can see. In some cases, it may be because of discipline. We may have done something that has violated God, our relationship with Him. We've gone our own way, and we've, ch- we've chosen to walk away from His truth. And so sometimes, God has to bring suffering to discipline us, to bring us back. The Scripture calls us and tells us that sometimes that discipline is hard. In fact, the the church of Corinth was going through some difficult times because they were walking contrary to God's will. And so they they had to suffer in in some cases. But Sometimes suffering can be preventative, such as in the case of Paul with his thorn in the flesh. He prayed, God, remove this. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient. And Paul realized that this thorn in the flesh, whatever that was, was to keep him humble. To keep pride from welling up. And sometimes God allows us to suffer because there's something in our life that He wants to keep at bay. And so we can trust God that He he knows what He's doing. A third reason for suffering that I see in the Scripture is that we need to learn obedience. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 5, we read this. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance, character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Sometimes we need to suffer so that we can learn to obey. The psalmist says, It was good that I was afflicted so that I would learn your ways. Even Christ Himself had to suffer on account of obedience. Hebrews 5 8 says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. So Jesus suffered as well. But then also, suffering is not just for you, it allows you to bear the testimony of Christ in a better way so that someone else can see it. How you respond to suffering can communicate how big your God is. Is your God able to help you in your suffering? Is your God bigger than what you're dealing with right now? And so suffering is an opportunity for us to declare the very glory of God. So understanding those things, really wrapping our head around those, wrapping our arms around those can can really set us on the right course. Experience of this church in Smyrna, although it's something we, we wouldn't crave, I mean, none of us really say, okay, God, it's Monday morning, bring on the suffering. I mean, who says that, right? None of us. But with what he's doing here with this church at Smyrna, is he's wanting them to recognize that suffering's going to come. It's going to be there. You can handle it.
handle it. You can handle it well. You got to trust me. You have to know that I know it. You have to, you have to know that, that I'm in control. So those are some critical truths. But, but he kind of gives them some, a little bit of encouragement too. When he says you will have tribulation for 10 days, what is he talking about there? I think it's best to understand that as being symbolic for a definite but limited period of time. I don't think it's talking about a literal, it, your suffering is only going to last 10 days. No. When you look at other parts of Scripture, you can see that um, this, is, this is true. But he's trying to tell them that there's a duration. This too shall pass. I'm reminded of what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. After you have suffered for a little while, in light of eternity, the suffering we face now is only temporary. The experiences that we're going through now, they will cease. And you're like, but Pastor, you don't know. I, I, I'm in the midst of something that's been going on and on and on and on. You're right, I don't know all of that. But Jesus does. And His encouragement to you is this. It will end. We don't know how it's going to end. And we don't know when. But we can trust the one who does. It will end. Reminded also that when we come through these things, God looks good. Remember what Jesus said, or what James says in chapter 1, verse 2 says, Consider it all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. When we endure, God looks good. I think that's what our world needs to see is the God who looks good. We can respond with faithfulness is our last truth. Our last truth is we can respond. He says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. There's no condemnation to this church. And so Jesus provides two motivations. Provides two motivations to help them and us respond with faithfulness. And it's looking ahead. We ought to be motivated by the crown of life. There are two words in Scripture to talk about crowns. There's the word that is associated with a crown of royalty, and there's a word that's associated with the crown of victors. The word that Jesus uses here for crown is the, is the crown that's associated with victors. Uh, if you go back in history and you look, they had the Olympic Games, and what was it that they received? They received a crown, a laurel wreath that was put on their head, and it was given to those who won the games. And everybody would see that they were the victors. That's the word that is used here, the victor's crown. And so Jesus is trying to motivate them. He's trying to motivate them with this crown that is given to those who are victors is the crown of eternal life. Eternal life is promised to all those who trust in Jesus Christ alone. That is your victory. You can endure the suffering you can stay faithful in all of your difficulties because you look ahead and you say, no matter what this world is going to do to me, they cannot take away my eternal life. And God, all God's people said what? Amen to that. So that ought to motivate us to be faithful. They can't take that away from us. But then Jesus also gives us something else here. He says we ought to be motivated by our victory over the second death. Well, what in the world is the second death? We need to understand in Scripture that death is a separation. When we die physically, our bodies are, are separated from our soul. And our soul either goes to be with God or, or goes to uh, et eternal damnation away from God. So there's a separation. So when he's talking about second death, what is that separation he's talking about? All right? Well, we understand about the second death from the book of Revelation. All right? Revelation 20, verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. We find more truth in chapter 21, verse 8. Who's going to be in that lake? For the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is the death we must fear only if we do not know Christ as our Savior. If, if we are here this morning and we've never trusted and Jesus Christ is, 
as our Savior, then Jesus is speaking to you. You need to fear the second death. Because that second death is you being eternally separated from God. But for the believer, we are in Christ and we are motivated by that truth that because Jesus was victorious over a physical death, He provided eternal life for all those who trust in Him. And this second death, this being eternally separated from God, is never going to happen to us. In fact, I love Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with Him for a thousand years. If you are in Christ this morning, then you are free. You do not have to fear the second death. And that should motivate you to be faithful. I don't have to worry about anything this world is going to throw at me. I don't have to worry about how hard my difficulty is going to be because regardless of that difficulty, it cannot separate me from my God. And that ought to motivate us to be faithful. Jesus is challenging us. There is glory on the other side. Don't get lost in this. Look ahead. So what are some implications for us in 2023 and beyond? I wanted to simplify this as much as I could because I know that's kind of been somewhat of a weighty message. But I want us to understand this. Two things. Regardless of what the world says about us, we are overcomers. We are overcomers. Don't let the world try to put you in its box. Don't let the world try to define who you are. We may be poor physically, but we're rich spiritually. You don't need to find success in material possessions. Our success is defined by God and being what He wants us to be. Don't allow the evaluations of the world to suck you in and cause you to lose sight of who you really are. You're victorious if you're in Christ. You're an overcomer. You're already a victor. So live victoriously. We can do that. And then no matter how severe a persecution or suffering may become, there's nothing to fear. We can look at our world. We can look at the things going on in our country. We, we, we can look at all these things. And one of Satan's greatest tactics is to use fear to keep us from doing what we know we ought to do. And Jesus says, do not fear. Why? Because I'm in control. I'm in control of all things. Time, life, death, anything that we experience, He's in control. We need God's help, but we can be faithful. Let's stay faithful until death. Regardless of what this world throws at us, Jesus says, be faithful. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that we would be faithful that we would stay faithful to you till the end of our days. Remind us of the truths here this morning that give us a theology of suffering well. Lord, I pray that all of us here would, would learn how to suffer in, in the right way, that we, we bring all the glory to you. We may not have all the answers, but we can trust the one who does. And so we, we give ourselves to you here this morning, thanking you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.